Hey, this is Joe Vaughn, and you're listening to the Littleton Church Podcast. I'm excited about the message I'm bringing to you this week. It is the final lesson in our Love and Thunder series. It comes from 3rd John. We're talking about hospitality, being ambassadors, and power. I want to invite you to join us at 10 a.m. And listen, this Sunday is Serve Day. So come on and help us serve our community. we got a few community projects we're doing. Meet us here at church for worship at 10 a.m. And then we'll go and serve our community. I'd love to meet you in person. You can also view us online at littletonchurch.org. Make sure to like, share, and subscribe to whatever application you're listening to. I can't wait to give you God's word. Here it is. Third John. Good morning, church, friends and family. Thanks for being here. First time guests, we're honored by your presence. Thank you for being here. Uh, Despite what the video bump says, we're actually in Third John. I just, I just keep forgetting to change that. But so uh, somebody's really disappointed today. I know. But just go back and listen to First John, those sermons on that. I'm just kidding. I don't think anybody's really all that disappointed that we're in Third John. But for the one person who may be disappointed, we are in Third John today. I just want to reiterate some things that are happening in our church. Next week is Serve Day, so service is going to be a little abbreviated. Uh, so it'll, we will have communion together, uh, but I just won't be speaking as long. Usually when sir, when uh, when services are abbreviated, it means the preacher is just going shorter. That's all it means. But next week uh, is Serve Day. We're really excited about it. Pick up those shirts. Wear your Serve Day shirt next week. And we will be partnering with Redeemer Church, who shares the building with us that we've allowed to plant their church in the Myers Theater. We'll be partnering with them. So it'll be an ecumenical project that we're doing together. We have those three projects. We're really excited about it, so come ready and prepare to hear more about it this week and ways in which you can be involved. Make sure to pick up the flyers on the way out so you can give to your neighbors. Make sure to give your donations. Uh, I'm, I'm very proud that we've well exceeded our goal of collecting $500 for teachers, that we've collected well over $1,000, maybe I don't even know, maybe even $2,000, so we're able to bless more teachers in the area with gift cards and thank you. So thank you so much, church, for giving to support that. Very excited about Serve Day. All right, and then you may hear us talk about this, circles are better than rows. That means small groups are going to start in September. Some of you have already been meeting and some of the leaders have already been talking. I appreciate the plug from Phil. Uh, They have an excellent group. It'd be great for you to join that group. And I love what they're doing with Lectio Divina. It is a way to be in God's word and to allow the spirit to move and to to discern it in community. It's really, really beautiful. So next, excuse me, August 28th, I'll be hosting a small group leaner training for all people who are leading groups. And then if you're interested in starting your own group, we need more groups to get new people and more people plugged into community here at Littleton Church. All right, let's pray together and then I want to get into the message. Let's pray. Holy Father, we thank you so much for your son, Jesus Christ, and for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for salvation, and Father, for making us holy, and Father, for restoring us, and for empowering us through your Spirit. Father, we pray, Lord, that your word today, your word would aliven us inside of our hearts, Father, that we would hear you, and we would put your words into practice this day. Father, help us, Lord, to turn away from our sins and to turn towards you, which is repentance. Father, and may we accept your forgiveness and all the love that comes through Jesus Christ, our Lord. As together, we all say, amen. All right, well, so we're in this series called Love and Thunder. When I'm talking about love and thunder, I'm talking about how the Apostle John identifies with love. He says, I'm the one, the beloved disciple. I'm the one who Jesus loves. That's how he identifies when he writes his gospel, and, and he writes about love a lot. He writes about love and truth, particularly in the letters. He wants people to understand what real love is and what real truth is. He wants people to stay in the truth. Last week, we talked about truth and love and love and truth. Go back and listen to that message so that you can hear what John has to say about it, how we explored those principles together as a congregation. And, and so love is this. When I'm talking about love, I mean the heart of God 
And then when we're talking about thunder, that's the glory of God in the spirit of God. That's the glory of God in the spirit of God. And I believe that's what John wants us to have. He wants us to have the heart of God, that our heart matches God's will. And he wants us to realign our passions with what God's passionate about. Because I consider that John is a passionate person. And in the beginning of his calling to Jesus' ministry, you see him with misdirected, misguided passion. But through Christ, that Jesus is able to then teach him and instruct him and guide him in the will of God and what real love looks like when you're dealing with real people. And so John is writing to a congregation who is missing out. They have misguided love and misguided truth, and John's setting the course right for them. But there's some roadblocks, and one in particular we'll read about here in Third John. Let's stand together at the reading of God's Word, if you will. If you're able to stand, please stand with me. We're going to look at the whole chapter of Third John. It's 14 verses. And help me reading this. Read aloud the words that are in yellow. Y'all on board say amen. 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 All right, this is the Word of God for the people of God. The elder, this is John referring to himself, the elder, to my dear friend, Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. It gave me great joy when some believers came and testified about your faithfulness to the truth, telling how you continue to walk in it. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Dear friend, you are faithful in what you're doing for the brothers and sisters. Even though they are strangers to you, they have told the church about your love. Please send them on their way in a manner that honors God. It is for the sake of the name that they went out, of Jesus that they went out, receiving no help from the pagans. We ought, therefore, to show hospitality to such people so that we may work together for the truth. I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first, will not welcome us. So when I come, I will call attention to what he is doing, spreading malicious nonsense about us. Not satisfied with that, he even refuses to welcome other believers. He also stops those who want to do so and puts them out of the church. Dear friend, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. Anyone who does what is good is from God, and anyone who does what is evil has not seen God. Demetrius is well spoken of by everyone, and even by the truth itself. We also speak well of him, and you know that our testimony is true. I have much to write to you, but I do not want to do so with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon, and we will talk face to face. Peace to you. The friends here send their greetings. Greet the friends there by name. This is a reading from God's Word in 3 John. If you believe in God's Word, say some, somebody say, I believe in the Word of God. Word. Somebody say, I trust the name of Jesus. All right, you may be seated. Thank you so much. All right, so this letter is the smallest letter in the New Testament, and it has identical closings as John's second epistle. Second John, right? And then what's interesting about this letter, it's the only New Testament book that doesn't mention Jesus and Christ. I mean, you saw the name, but it doesn't say Jesus and Christ in there. It's interesting. In 3 John, we find this letter as this kind of brief note to a heroic Christian. Right? Somebody who's standing firm in the community while they're struggling against the pressure of a single antagonist. This is his dear friend, Gaius. And this house church that John's writing is embattled. It's in a struggle. And its struggle is over power, polity, doctrine. It's this relational power struggle. And this letter here written to his dear friend, Gaius, is to someone who's showing a tremendous amount of courage 
even when another leader seems to have hijacked the people of God there. Now, even though this leader, Diotrephes, is not welcoming the people and even casting out those who welcome those sent by John, Gaius chooses to go against this person and welcome Demetrius in to his home. Did y'all catch that? That He's showing courage here in this power struggle. He's hosting the emissaries that have been sent by John. He's hospitable and he's generous. He's faithful to the truth about Jesus and he's walking in that love and truth and he's being commended by it. Diotrephes, though, is rejecting all things John. He's rejecting John's letter. He's rejecting the authority of John. He's rejecting the emissaries that are sent by John. He's refused to accept John publicly and he's spreading rumors about John's character and he's threatening anyone who chooses to speak with those who were sent by John. I think there's a, an easy moral to make here, be Gaius and not Diotrephes, right? That the church needs more people like Gaius. It needs more people who open the door than those who shut the door. It needs more people who are generous and hospitable. The church needs to receive the emissaries of God. Like the church needs to be always a place that considers that each new person and each new friend or each new acquaintance is entertaining angels. That the church needs to be a place that is open to receiving someone We're just reading that in our Bible class this morning in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 that Paul refers to something as you opened your heart to us just as we opened our hearts to you. See, because Paul, even though you might think of him as some A-type person who's busy planting churches and doesn't have time for people, that's really not who Paul was in the letter because he has learned how to build relationships with people by opening up his heart to them. Like Paul was open-hearted, which made him considerably vulnerable to attacks from his enemies within the church and outside of the church because Paul would just open himself up because he, he has no other way of showing the love of Christ. And I would dare say for us that we must be open-hearted not only to the gospel of Jesus Christ, but to the strangers that we meet because there's no other way to demonstrate love. There's no other way to live as someone who's a follower of Jesus. You might say, well, I've been burned before. I can't open my heart to people. But God can heal you and God can demonstrate a way for you to open your heart that would allow the peace of his love, of Jesus Christ, to to rest on that person. It could be reciprocated to you. If it's not, that's okay. But you have to open your heart. You have to open your heart because opening our heart is what really makes us Christ's ambassadors. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, the apostle Paul says, We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. The only real way that we can bring people near to God is through the open-hearted love of Jesus Christ. That's how we bring people near. to That's how we reconcile humanity with their creator. That's how we reconcile people with one another is through open-hearted love and leadership. And so John sends... Demetrius, to encourage them to follow Jesus. And he commends him for his good character and great reputation and that the church knows him well there. He's a, he's a good person to send because what's happened in this church here is that the world has infiltrated it. Um, the world's principles and the way to deal with power and teachings. The world has infiltrated this church. And John knows of this because he writes about it in his letter in the Gospel of John. He, he says, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. This is Jesus' words. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Elsewhere, Jesus' disciples will talk about that we are to be in the world, but not of the world, right? We live in the world. There's no other place to live. I think even maybe Tim Kelly referred to this in his sermon on in Christ in Babylon, that for the Jews there, they, they were to build houses. They were to 
work the land, they were to marry, they were to do and be faithful to God. But in a hostile environment, they were to be faithful. And in many ways, that was them being faithful not only to God's word, but also to God's greater plan to draw all people into his kingdom, even Babylonians. They were to resist, but they were also to remain hospitable. Like they were to do the work of God, even in foreign territory. And here the foreign territory has entered into the church, and John knows all about this because Jesus warned him that that people will not like you, John, because you like me, Jesus says. Like, like the, the reason they're not going to like you is because you follow my words and you do what I say. The reason they're not going to like you is because the message that you are. Like you're an ambassador of Christ, and even though you're giving hope and love, people will resist it. People will not like the message that you bring. And this is what's happening in the church because people are discrediting the apostle John in this church. Jesus didn't really come in, God didn't really come in the flesh and God would never allow himself to be crucified on a cross. So they were discounting the incarnation of Jesus. This is a major, major error from the people in the church. And so for John, the hatred comes in them rejecting his authority or for Diotrephes. Can we just call him D? <laughs> Helps me out. I put, like in my notes, I just put D. I was tired of like <laughs> typing out this name, like, you know. D. The one whom cannot be named. Isn't that how Harry Potter does it? Y'all don't, re- y'all don't, do y'all read, Har- do y'all read Harry Potter? <laughs> do you guys read Harry Potter? One quick Harry Potter joke. Um, <laughs> I remember... Uh, the church I served in Alabama, and we had a church library. And this lady said, came up and said, my goodness, can you believe that they're allowing our children to read Harry Potter in schools? In fact, even one of the Christian schools down the road allows the kids to read Harry Potter. That is witchcraft, and that's demonic. And I'm like, okay, yes, ma'am. And she says, does our church library have Harry Potter in it? No, no ma'am, we, we do not have Harry Potter in our church library, and then the associate minister, Eric, came over and said, hey, come here, let me show you something. And he, he pulled me in the church library, and then right there, on, like on the middle shelf, like oh, the whole volume of all the Harry Potter books. And I'm like, oh, we do have Harry Potter here. Okay. <laughs> Just don't tell, that, don't tell that lady. Nobody tell that lady here, please. No one tell her. <laughs> that joke serves no purpose. Um, There's no segue into the next point. Okay, so there, so when, so he's got this person who is objecting to his authority, and that's why he begins the letter, as you notice, the elder, right? He's saying, hey, I, I have some authority here, you know, the, the elder. Um, it appears that D did not want an overseer. He didn't want an overseer for this church. Uh, maybe it's because he thought, hey, we're independent now, and uh, we can go our own way. We can do our own thing. We're, we're independent. Um, you know, our, it kind of reminds me of our culture today in many ways, um, or the Western culture, particularly the United States that we live in. Uh, our Western culture really resists authority. Y'all know this to be true. Come on. We resist authority. We do. Uh, the U.S., in fact, has a low power dissonance. So out of a scale of 100, 100 being like you respect authority and those in power, you will listen to them, right? We're 40 out of 100, right? Uh, Mexico's like in the 90s. Russia's like way up there, Okay. Comrade says it, you do it, right? All right, this is different than how we operate. Um, We reject hierarchy. We question all people who sit in places of power. You know we do, all the time, all the time. If they say it, we're like, "Mm, but really though, right? We even instruct our children, right? 
we do this. I do this. I'm like, when Ariana's home with the girls, anybody comes to our door, I don't care if they're wearing a fireman's outfit. I don't care if they're wearing a police uniform. Do not open the door. They are not welcome. You know what I mean? Because I'm not there. Right? No, don't, don't judge me too hard, but that's just, you know, y'all do this. Y'all do this. Even if a, a teacher comes and says something that's clearly maybe in their syllabus and maybe your child didn't exactly do it the way it's told, what do you do? Right? You're like, well, that teacher, she don't know what she's talking about, right? Come on now. Y'all know y'all do this to teachers all the time. We, I'm just giving examples about how we kind of are resistant to anybody in an authoritative position. We are. In fact, we demand and are entitled that everyone have a certain level of power. And our decision-making is democratic, right? Um, in our church, the way our church is designed, the way Churches of Christ are, there's a, I know they don't like to be referred to as a board of elders, there's a group of elders, right, that, that work with the ministry staff, right? So churches are governed by a group, right, a group. In Churches of Christ, in many restoration churches, a group, a group of men and women, a group of elders, right, that are able to guide the church, right? So that's, that's how our churches are set up. Not all churches are like that, though, right? Some churches have, like, the guy, the pastor, and, um, and so they're set up with that, and then they may be elder protected in some way. But we usually lean towards democratic decision-making, as long as it, I dare say, serves our purposes, amen, right? So there are examples of churches and people in churches that resist authority. I can think of some personal ones. Uh, so we're talking about small groups here at our church. I remember, so the church I served in Alabama, um, we started small group ministry while I was employed there. And you would have thought, you know, we had ripped out Matthew's gospel, you know. Um, we started small group ministry. We're like, do house churches, everybody, do house churches. And and one of the deacons got our church letterhead and sent a letter to every household in our church telling them, this is a bad idea. Everybody's going to do what they want to do. They're not going to follow good teaching anymore. They're going to be like little mini churches everywhere. And he, he, he sent that out. He took our church. Like, who? How? You know, do you think that's a good thing? Like you're like representing the church and you take our, you steal, I say steal our church letterhead and mail everybody and, and then say, you know, I'm just trying to be faithful to the word. No, no, you're not. No, you're not. You're, you're, you're being someone who's rejecting what the shepherds have said are the direction that the church need to go, right? I mean, you can reject it, that's fine, but trying then to persuade the whole church to follow you, that's, that's not... That's not cool, right? Right? Uh, I even, I think about uh, another, I have a pastor friend who is working just with a Bible teacher in his church that has a pretty large following, but in his Bible class, he will openly criticize the pastor and the elders, and this has been allowed to go on for years, and I'm just like, why would y'all let that happen? You know what I mean? Like, like that can't be good for the health of the church. And so you, you may have experienced that at some point in your life. Maybe it's in your workplace. There's some division or maybe there's something. But maybe you understand maybe what's happening here with John and the church and how he's trying to, to, to use everything that he has to, uh, to save this church from following teachings that says Jesus isn't really the Son of God. He didn't come in the flesh. And, and to... To, to misalign the doctrine of Christ, to pull people away from the truth. John is trying. He's trying. And he's even sending people, emissaries on his behalf, like, will you go help? Like, this is, this church is in dire straits. Like, they're, they're about to lose it all. And so then he sent, and then there's one individual who's like blocking them and even intimidating the rest of the people. Like, even, hey, listen up. If you even host these people, I'm kicking you out of the church. Who, who is this guy, right? But this is what's happening here. And the underlying problem with Diotrephes could be doctrine, it could be polity. I mean, it could be, I mean, let's just think about him. That he could be like a really intellectual person. I mean, it doesn't say, I'm just thinking about this. Maybe he's even charismatic, influential. Maybe he's even wealthy. 
He holds a lot of cards. He's able to persuade the church. I think maybe his threats actually have teeth to them. You know what I mean? Like he's not just a nobody. He's probably somebody who wields some sort of relational power with, with the community there. And, and, and so he's, he's, he's embraced these contrary teachings on Jesus. So maybe, maybe. But what's interesting about this is that John doesn't call him an antichrist or a false teacher like he does in the other letters. Like when you read his other letters, he's like, antichrist, antichrist. You, you remember? He, he doesn't name him as such, so maybe he's not exactly like that. He may not be described in that way, but he seems to be led, leveraging the controversies for his own gain, the false teachings and the, the people who say, who are denying Jesus, uh, the, de- denying his, uh, uh, that he is the Christ. And, and he's, maybe what he's doing is he's just rejecting John's leadership and his authority by just kind of creating some doubt, right? You know how that works. Like, it's the, the I'm just saying person, right? You know, can we really trust John? I mean, I'm just saying, you know, John hasn't been able to keep this church from tearing apart. Uh, I'm just saying, I'm just saying maybe he's not the best leader. He's not even around. I think the main thing, though, that we can clearly identify and learn from Diotrephes is that he has a lack of hospitality and he's intimidating. So for us, how can we be an anti-D, an anti-Diotrephes? How are we to be a person or a group of people who practice hospitality? What is our relationship to Jesus and power? Because hospitality in Luke 10, when Jesus sends out the 72, hospitality was something that allowed them to recognize who was for them and who may not be open to the gospel that the kingdom of God is near. That they were to rely on hospitality. When they were sent out, they couldn't take anything with them. Do you do you remember the story? If you don't, Jesus sends out his disciples two by two, and he says, don't take anything with you because you're basically going to rely on the people's generosity when you go into a new community. And he says, give peace to them. If that peace is returned to you, you stay there, you set up a healing ministry, you give the good news to that community there. And as long as they'll have you, you stay in their home. Don't bounce around from home to home getting free meals. Stay with them. And as long as they have you there, then they're going to be open. Somebody who will open their home to you may open their heart to you. Somebody who will open their home to you and give you something will open their heart to your message and what you have to say. They will receive Jesus. So hospitality is an indicator that somebody is open to the ways of Jesus. And also hospitality is this indicator that somebody has met Jesus and wants to share the love of Christ with other people. And so it's a major, major injustice that he would not receive John's friends. And that he would punish people for receiving them. And in Matthew 25, Jesus describes that he separates sheep and goats. If you're familiar, he talks about a scenario, it seems like an end times kind of thing or a judgment, where the sheep are the people who received And the goats are the ones who shut the door, right? That the sheep are hospitable to the hungry. They give them food. The sheep are hospitable to those who are naked. They give them clothes. The sheep are hospitable to those in prison. They go and visit them. The sheep are hospitable to the stranger, to the least among the community. Those are the sheep. We want to be sheep. (laughs) We want to be sheeple. We do. We're trying to redefine sheeple here. But D treats the people sent by John as a godless person would. Are he supposed to be a leader in the church and he treats them like he doesn't even know God? Because I don't know if you notice this in verse 7 that when they're going about their business trying to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, the pagans wouldn't receive them. They received no help from pagans, from godless people. And here's D, doing what pagans would do. And I think John recognizes this abuse of power well. 
because he wanted this kind of power to, to do what D had done before he understood the fullness of Christ's love. In the Gospel of Matthew, James and John's mother kneeled down before Jesus and begged Jesus to make her two boys the greatest in the kingdom. Will you let one of my boys sit on your left and one on your right? And John and James had already asked of this, but now they send their mother. Mom, you're sweet. Jesus will listen to you. But Jesus says this, church, lean in. He says, he calls them all together in Matthew 20. He says, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. Like this is how godless people abuse power. Lord it over them. And their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you instead. Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Do you remember how John describes D? Loves to be first. Well, that D loves to be first. But the principles of Jesus are that the first shall be last. That the greatest is the least. That like true demonstration of power is power under control. It's meekness. It is using your power not to close doors, but to open them wide for the least in the community. Not to close doors, but to open them wide for somebody who brings the good news of Jesus Christ into your home, into your church, into your community. You open the door wide to them. You have an open-hearted reception for them. Now, Jesus says, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's who we're called to be. Will you stand with me? I'm going to invite the worship team to come up, and I want to leave you with this one thought today. This is, this is really it. This is the one thought today. The reason that John was so upset at this church was this church was not operating by how it was supposed to be designed. That a church is to be an outpost. It's to be an outpost. If there's travelers on the way, if there's strangers coming, we're to be an outpost. And we serve as hosts and ambassadors. So the church isn't just to be a place where we park ourselves, but a church is a place where we send ourselves out. Like we send people out. You are emissaries of the Littleton Church. Or you're emissaries of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Like you are ambassadors for him and you host him and you send him out with others. Like you host people, you, any stranger you meet, any person, any child, any, any person, you receive them to send them. Like we come here to receive this fellowship in the Lord so that we'd be encouraged and walk out with some strength and, and that we'd, we'd have some substance to our lives. We believe that what we're doing matters and, and then we encourage people to follow along with us because we rejoice in the Lord. Like we're, we're, not, we're not holding and pumping the brakes on somebody who has a passion for the Lord. We're not, we're not doing that here. That's not who Jesus called us to be. We're, we're an outpost. Can you say we're an outpost? We're an outpost. We're an outpost. We're an outpost. And when people come, like, oh, I, I told you that uh, we got to drive up and summit, you know, America's mountain and in Colorado Springs, right? And so from jump, like, these people, like, with rudimentary tools and, like, I don't know how they built things in the 1800s, uh, but they managed to build, like, an outpost up there. Like, so if anybody summited the mountain, they were like, here's a hot drink, here's a hot meal. I mean, like, just this wooden building, you know, and then now that's really nice. I mean, you go there, the Welcome Center is amazing um, up there. Um, you can get like soup and salad and donuts. They have donuts up there. I, I tried them. I had to. I was like, they say they're like world famous, so let's give them a try. They're pretty good. Um, but they, they recognize that people were on this long, arduous path and journey. When they get up there, they're going to need some sustenance. They're going to need some care, and they're probably going to need some encouragement to get back down, right? And that's, that's who we are. We're here for the weary traveler, but yet we're also here for the person that brings good news. I can't help but think about how the scripture talks about that. Beautiful are the feet that bring good news. 
Like we consider like the person who brings the good news, like somebody who's full of the love of Jesus Christ and, and full of hope, like, like they're beautiful and what they bring is beautiful to us. It's made beautiful. And that's how we show our appreciation for what Jesus has done. I, I love that imagination for the church and who we can be and who we are becoming in that. We agree to be an outpost. We be, agree to be a host and an ambassador. I want to pray over us and then We're going to accept your prayers. You can get your prayers in on the chat or you can follow the prompts on the screen. We want to pray over you and we want to bless you in the name of the Lord. Let's pray together. Holy Father, we thank you so much for your love and your generosity. Father, we thank you for this this story. Um, Father, may we be um, like Gaius who against the threats of even this church leader, he hosted the people sent by John. And Lord, may we host well, may we encourage, may we give strength so that people can be sent well. It's in Christ Jesus' name we pray and all together we say, amen. Let's, let's worship.